Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey podcast. This is the Happy Half Hour, which means it's Friday, and you've almost made it to the weekend, and I'm just going to give you 30 minutes of goodness right here. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm super excited that you're listening. Every week on Wednesdays, I invite a girlfriend to join me on the show, and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. But on this Friday Happy Half Hour, we do things a little bit different. Um, I never get enough time to usually talk to my guests, so I'm like bringing guests back on, and we're going to ask very specific questions uh, just for you. So today, I have my friend Jessica Turner on. Hi, Jessica. Hey, hey. How Welcome are you? Welcome back. I'm good. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. You were my guest on happy hour number 30, which at this point seems like forever ago. It does seem forever ago. The thing I remember most about being on your podcast was I had just had my third son, Ezra. He was like less than a month old. And he had one of those like massive baby poops where it was everywhere (laughs) right as I was supposed to get on with you. And I was like, can we wait five minutes? Because I have to clean poop all over my couch. I do remember that. Yes. Disaster. Uh Uh-huh. Yep. That's what I remember about being on your podcast. (laughs) As if no one can relate that's listening. I mean, we've all had those moments. If you're a mom and you're a mom that you've ever had a newborn, you know, they poop yeah. at the most inconvenient times. Yes. <laughs> and the blowout ones are the worst. So it was fun having you on. You came on, I think it was probably right before you released your book, The Fringe Hours. Am I right? Yeah, right around there. I had Ezra New Year's Eve and then I released the book six weeks later. So yeah, it was right in the thick of that time of birthing books and babies. Which for is me. crazy. What was harder, birthing a book or a baby? Um, I don't know. Both were pretty tiring. <laughs> That's what I hear. That's exactly what I hear. So um, let's get, let's jump right in. Awesome. All right, Jessica, what is something you've read, watched, or heard that you can't stop recommending? You can do all three. You can do one, whatever you like. Oh, so much goodness that I could start with. I think I'm going to start with what I'm watching right now, which is the show Outlander. Have you watched this before? I haven't. Um, When Rachel Hollis was on earlier this year, she mentioned that she loves the books. Right. Okay. So I have not read the books. I have heard nothing but phenomenal things, but they are, I don't know, a thousand pages or more. And so that literally just scares me. Yeah. It feels really overwhelming, but the show is on stars and I will say it's some parts of it are a little risque, but it is fascinating to me. It's about a woman named Claire Frazier who is, it starts out in the early 1900s and she time travels back to the 18th century in Scotland. And so the whole first season takes place in Scotland. And then the second season, which is what is on right now, takes place in Paris, France. And the costuming in the show is so unbelievable. Like it's worth watching it just for the costumes alone. I mean, it's just really fascinating. But you've got this woman who she's trained as a nurse and she uh, knows a lot. And she goes back 200 years where there's lots of things that they don't know and vaccines that they don't have. And uh, it's just a fascinating show. I really, really like it. And I'm a huge historical fiction reader. And so I think that Kind of pull that out of you so much. Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing it on the screen. As for something I've read, you and I have talked about this offline, but The Kitchen House is probably my favorite book that I've read this year. It's not a new book, um, but it is my favorite book, I think, of at least so far of 2016. I absolutely loved that book. And then the sequel just released in April called Glory Over Everything. And I loved that as well. And so those are the books that I keep finding myself talking about this year. Yeah. I, Kitchen House, I read a couple of years. I don't know how long it's been out, but I read it a year or two ago. And I remember that I loved the characters so much that it was like one of those books when I closed the last page, I was thought, I'm going to miss them tomorrow. Like, that's what I felt about the book is that I love right. their characters. And I saw you post about glory over everything. And of course, I was like, how do you have this? Tell me <laughs> now. Um, and you graciously connected me to the author. And I read it too. And which one did you like better? I think I liked The Kitchen House more only because it is about two women, and I think I like female main characters more. Yeah, because the next one was a man. Uh The next one is um, a male character and a female character are kind of the two main voices of the book. But I think those two contrasting female characters, for those of you who aren't familiar with The Kitchen House, it is a book that takes place in the early 1800s in the South on a large plantation. It deals a lot with slavery. One of the main characters is a slave 
slave in the kitchen house on um, the plantation. And the other main character is an indentured servant. And so she grows up in the kitchen house, but kind of straddling those two worlds of black and white in the 1800s. And um, she it starts with her being a very young girl and kind of her story over, I think, about 25, 30 years and what that looks like for her um, growing up on a plantation and then growing up into an adult white woman where they kind of bring her into the house and and all of the different race and class issues that go along with that during that period. Just a really fascinating book. Highly recommend. I love that as well. Okay, Jessica, you and your husband are both authors full-time. You got three kids. You travel. You work full-time. Um, how do you recharge? What makes you recharge or what helps you recharge? I think one thing that really helps me recharge is reading, is just ah. stopping. My husband says, if I am not reading, I'm a different person. And I've really made a big commitment to slow down this year because last year was so busy with the baby and having two books come out. It just was a lot. And I found myself kind of at the bottom of my barrel. And so 2016, I decided it was going to be a year of rest. And one of the ways that I rest is by reading. And so last month I read seven books I in just one month. I saw that. Which was literally the most books I've read in years in a month. And I feel so great. And frankly, I really needed it because May is really busy for me. And I think I'm going to need to suck some of that gasoline that I got in April from reading all of those books this month. So taking time to read and, and just be quiet, um, saying no in my schedule so that I can have some of that space mm -hmm. is really, really important for me. That's good. I find reading for me is also a great, great way for me to recharge, but it's also the first thing I let go. Um, and I'm kind of like you. I'm in a busy season this month. This year, I think I've read six books total. And like my goal is 36. I'm way behind schedule. Um, but I, too, like reading like you do, and so it's a very recharging thing. Uh, do you read at night? Do you read in the morning? When do you read? So I am really big on reading during times of waiting. So on average, one of the things I found in my research for Fringe Hours was that we wait 45 to 60 minutes a day. Crazy. And so often we're just scrolling on our phones, right? So I've yes. tried to be a lot better about having a book with me. I just downloaded and signed up for Audible and got my first Audible book. Um, so I'm starting to do that like even while I'm doing laundry that I'm listening to a book or I've got a 35 minute commute most mornings. And so I've got time there that I can be listening to something. So if I'm not listening to a podcast now, I thought, well, maybe I could throw it yeah. in a book, on, you know, on my commute that way. And then I do read a lot at night, at least one or two nights a week. I will go and take a bath and really have kind of an extended period after the kids go to bed to just have that quiet time to read. I'm like, you like to read in the bath. Okay. What is a specific app or gadget or piece of technology that you just can't find yourself living without and why? I love Voxer. I don't know oh. if anyone has talked much about Voxer on your show, uh, but I love it. It's an app where basically it's like voice texting. And I have lots of friends that live in different time zones or even different countries, and it allows me to stay connected with them. And also, I think because my schedule is so different, because I work full time outside of the home, I sometimes don't have that capacity during the day when maybe some of my friends have time to talk. And so me being able to leave a message to them early in the morning as I'm going to to work and then they can respond during the day really helps stay connected with a lot of my friends. So Voxer's a, a huge, huge part of my life and my friendships. I have this love-hate relationship with Voxer. Um, I love it when I love it and I hate it when I hate it, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, I can get very overwhelmed by it. Um, I was in a great Voxer group before that I just felt like I felt like I couldn't contribute to it very much and it kind of overwhelmed me. So I got out. Um, and like, I miss those girls. It was so much fun. And now I'm in one that all of us are authors and we're new, fairly new authors. And so it's just like information overload that I'm loving. So I kind of go in waves with Voxer, but it is a really great app to keep in touch with people. I agree. And to have a group, like if you had a group of moms or like from right. a group of authors, it's a great place for us to just throw information ideas out. Yeah, I am not in any Voxer groups, so I would feel that that would probably get overwhelming for me because I'm a big no numbers on my phone. Like, I don't want to see that I have any updates, any email. <laughs> yeah, like, I everything know. has to be zero, and so that would probably really overwhelm me if I That's when I get overwhelmed, of, yes. Yes, I can absolutely appreciate yeah. that. I also get overwhelmed. You th I think you're going to be like me in this aspect. I see I have some girlfriends that on their phone, their mail says they have like 17,800 emails, and I literally sweat when I look at that. 
That doesn't seem like you would have that happen on your phone. Am I right? Oh, no, that is not happening. Oh, but it stresses me out. Jamie, my husband's, I think, is at like 77,000. I, I don't even, like, it I literally, cannot. I could lose sleep over that. No, I can't even look at his phone. It, it, is, <laughs> it just I, makes me stress thinking about it. And one of our iPads is synced to his email, and it gives me a panic attack. Like, I can't even look I at know. the iPad because that big, huge red number is oh. there. And I recognize, you know, I have a spam account where I send all of those emails that I don't read. So I probably have an account that would look like that if I had it loaded on my phone, but that is why it is not on my phone. Exactly, you know? exactly. <laughs> um, what is a dream that you had for yourself when you were younger that never came true? Either you just had to let it go or circumstances forced you to let it go. I wanted to be a famous actress. Oh, you know, you would not be you would be surprised how many times people say something like that. Yeah, I and I you know, I was did theater from the time I was about 8 through college. Wow, I, was I did a, not know that about you. Yeah, I was a theater major. I was in the high school play and musical all four years to community theater. Looking back, I don't know how my parents handled all of the things that I was doing related to theater growing up. I did camps every summer. I was voted, you know, most likely to be famous when I was in high school in the yearbook, you know, all of that. That was really what my whole life was centered around was that I wanted to do television. And my parents said that they would not help pay for college if I only majored in theater. That so that what was, do you think about that looking back? Um, I think they were they were right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't necessarily have a problem with that. They they knew that I had the drive that I could certainly have a double major and be fine. They just said, you know, you need to have another skill if we're making this investment in your schooling. Uh -huh. And so I double majored in theater and strategic communications, uh, which was a, a part of the journalism school. And I fell in love with it. And, you know, I was looking back, I was the ad manager of my high school paper and always kind of had a marketing sensibility to me. So it was a natural fit, I think. So I took all the theater classes and I did a couple of shows in college. And then I dropped that major to do more com. Okay. So if in a perfect world, if you could pursue that now, would you? I don't think so. Okay. Only because like I'm a mom of three, you know, like I, I can't imagine doing that. And I think even looking back on that, my life would have had to be so different and I'm so happy <laughs> with my life now. But I think that if I could have that opportunity kind of plopped in my lap to do television in some capacity, I would really enjoy it. I yeah. really enjoy being on camera. But I think that God has given me opportunities that fill kind of that same need through doing speaking at events and my blog and doing, you know, even video with big brands and things like that, that I do on the mom creative. So I feel like that is still satisfied and that gift that I have for communication is still being used. It just looks a little different and in a way that you couldn't dream of in right, yeah. right? Yeah. In 1988, I'm going to have a blog like that didn't even make sense. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Jessica, when you think of some of your best friends, what are some characteristics of them that make them so special to you? I think that they are good listeners, that they really see me. That's really important to me that I feel known. Mm. And the people that are closest to me know me, know my story, know my family. I was thinking about friendship this week and thinking about how hard it is as an adult when you make new friends. And even if they become your close friends, at least where I am now I'm in a place where my family is 12 hours away. Yeah. And so some of my closest friends don't know my family or they've met them, you know, one time on a visit to Nashville, but they don't know them and kind of our family history really well. And I think that's why I'm so thankful that I do have some close friends that have been my friends for a very long time, that they know my family history and know my story and, and know those parts of me that a lot of my close adult friends now don't know. Yeah. So I think being known is something that is really important to me in friendship. I think that's really good. And I think that's something that we all desire in all different aspects of relationships. And I like hearing people's answers when I ask them. And some of the things that are some of our deepest desires of human always kind of rise to the top as like what makes these people special is because they listen, because they know me for who I am. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's especially important for people who do stuff like you and I that kind of maybe in the public eye a little bit. We really like to be known like for real, like deep down, who am I? And that's right. really, really special. Um, in your, I don't know how old you are, in your 
30, I'm 33. 33 years How of old life. Am I? I said to Matthew, <laughs> I feel like I turned 30 and then I stopped counting. And I oh, have to exactly. remember I know. that, you know, I'm not still 30, right? you know. <laughs> you can keep saying that. That's fine with me. Um, in your 30-something years of life, what is some of the best advice you've ever received? Gosh, that is such a good question, Jamie. I think one of the best pieces of advice or just kind of mantras that I really try to hold true to me is that you always make time for what is important to you. Mm. And so if, and that's something that my mom used to say, and I think a friend of hers was who said that to her, that you always make time for what's important to you. And so if I feel burned out and overwhelmed and I'm not reading, like we talked about yeah. earlier, uh -huh. or I'm not scrapbooking, which is something that actually I haven't done a lot of this past year, and scrapbooking and memory keeping is something that's important to me. And so my priorities then are a little out of whack yeah. because you always make time for what's important to you. And so if you're saying – yes to things that at the end of your life you're not going to remember that are not going to have been meaningful that really didn't have um that didn't matter to you mm -hmm. you know how are you spending your days um is something that i think about a lot and i think about a lot right now with my kids being little and seeing how quickly they're growing and changing my middle child Adeline is going to kindergarten in the fall and I can't believe that I've already got two kids in elementary school and everyone says, you know, it goes so fast, it goes so fast. Mm -hmm. And so how am I spending my days? Am I doing the things that really matter, that are really important to me at a soul level? Um, and I think that's really good advice. Um, that is. It's really good to think about. And I was even just thinking that's really good for me to even think about. I, I, every time I ask someone that question, I usually think about what they say for a couple of days. And I would even think that that'd be even really good. Like you were instilled in that from your mom. I'm thinking I would like to instill that in my kids as well. Like, you know, you will do the things, um, you'll make time for the things that matter. And I think that's even good. Like your mom instilled that into you for us to instill that in our kids. And so thanks for that. I love that advice. Um, okay, Jessica, yes. you um, have, you're doing great things in your world and you are a successful author and blogger and mom and wife and your job, all of these things you're doing a great job at. What do you think is one thing that you do that is directly tied to your success? I think that I'm going to use my blogging and kind of online world specific in this answer. And for me, because I work full time and, and all of those other things have to be completed in kind of non-traditional work hours, I think something that has been very important to my success is that I'm good at planning. So I use an editorial calendar plugin on my blog called WordPress Editorial Calendar, and generally I'm scheduling out four to six weeks. Wow, I did not know that. And so I am that not. That means they're written and edited and ready to go. No, not necessarily, okay. but they are. Um, they maybe in various stages of okay. that. Okay. Um, but I'm contracted that far out. Okay. So when I get an opportunity, I get hundreds of emails a week from agencies and brands who are wanting to work with me and work with me on product releases and whatever else. And it makes it very easy for me to say no to most of those opportunities, even if they're good opportunities, because I already have booked out that far. I see. And so I'm able to be more intentional in my writing. I'm able to fit it in in smaller pockets because I know what's coming down the pike. Mm. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to say no. And I don't then over yes myself too much. Yeah. Sometimes I, I still say, oh, I could move that around and I could still make that work um, occasionally. But I think being a good steward of the time that I've been given and the space that I have and recognizing what my community will enjoy really makes a difference. And I hope that it makes a difference in the type of content that I'm writing and the quality of the content. Um, but I think that planning is really important. And I think along with that is having the appropriate help and the appropriate amount of help. So I have a virtual assistant who helps me just probably three to five hours a month do some of those littler tasks that uh, would bog me down because I don't have that capacity with mm -hmm. working full time. Um, I have a couple different agents, a speaking agent and a literary agent and a blog agent who also handle a lot of that negotiation for me. And that keeps me really focused on what it is that only I can do yeah. so that I'm 
I'm not getting bogged down doing administrative work or other things that other people can do well. Um, and then I can also remain focused on the things that matter to me, my children and what they were involved in and my passion projects and my husband For sure, um, because yeah. I have that capacity. That's great. I love that. What is that plugin you said? It's WordPress editorial calendar. Okay. And it lets you have drafts and to post and all That's kinds of right. stuff. And when you look at it, it's a calendar view mm. and you can drag posts around. And Ooh, so I, I do that, that a lot, but I can really clearly see what I have on the calendar for that week. And then I also can really clearly see what I've done in past years. I can easily go back to oh. May of last year and see what I was doing. Um, I use just a simple Excel document for tracking all of the campaigns that I do. And so I can look at last year and say, oh gosh, I did a big Mother's Day campaign or whatever it is um, really easily and then go back to that content. So it's really easy to use. We use it for the site that we manage at my day job and it's just a wonderful plugin. I recommend it to every single blogger out there. Well, that's good to hear you say that too because I know a lot of people are listening and they see um, someone like you who works outside the home and also runs a very successful online business and we see that from other people and we think to ourselves, does she write this every day? Like, what time is she getting up to put a post up? And so it's just good to see, like, from an outside perspective, you know, no, this is, I put plans in place and I plan ahead and I schedule. And so that's really good for you to um, tell us. But I am getting up really early every day. What time so. do you get up? Um, I try to get up by five. Every by day. five. Oh, my gracious. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm one of those people who doesn't need coffee. So I literally <laughs> start writing at like 5.02. Yeah, like right away. Like I'm downstairs on the couch writing. Um, now, certainly... I think it's important to acknowledge that I have a baby who doesn't sleep. And so some days don't look like that. Right. But that really is the goal. And I recognize that that's a season. So surely to God, the child will start to sleep <laughs> through the night soon, right? Surely. And I so, mean, most kids go to kindergarten sleeping through the night. So Yes. Yes. And But I mean, even on weekends, I, I'm not sleeping in ever past six o'clock. Like that's a late morning if I get up at six. So, so. how long do you write from 5.02 to when? Um, till 6 or 6.30, 6.30 okay. at the very latest. Um, I like to leave the house between 8.15 and 8.30. So um, Matthew, my husband, takes the kids to school and they leave by 7.45. And so that then gives me 30 to 45 minutes on the back end as well. So I like to shoot everything in natural light. And so I'll a lot of times do some photography that I need for the week or the upcoming week after they leave yeah. um, or some last minute social scheduling or some of that kind of stuff or you know get the kitchen cleaned up because I right. abandoned ship the <laughs> night before yeah. so I get um, that so it's both ends before everyone's awake and then after everyone has left is kind of when I'm getting a lot of that work done that's the hustle I mean you got to get it done yeah um, Jessica what's one of your pet peeves that you have <laughs> so I really hate when people use incorrect grammar oh gosh like in certain words or writing um, both. both. So okay. one of the ones that drives me nuts is when people say towards with an S instead of just toward. Um, towards with an S is not a word and it, it drives me crazy. Okay, give me and, an example. Like say it in a sentence. Um, I, I can't, like she walked towards him, you know, it, but she didn't walk towards him. There's no S. on. It's just toward. She walked toward him. Um, okay, I totally say it with an S. I can't, I like it. it, it just, she it's just, it's so funny. She walked towards him. Yeah, yeah no, I would totally say that. No, that's wrong. Like, <laughs> there's no S. Like, an S is not a thing. Um, so our, she walked toward him. Yes. Okay. Done. I'm, I'm, it's corrected from now on. It is. It is correct. Um, I'll tell you, our friend Annie Downs. Yeah. She posted about a single life workshop. This event that she went to, and it said at the top. I'm pulled. I just pulled it up on my Instagram. A journey towards intimate relationships. Oh. And and I was like, I can't even look at that book, Annie. <laughs> like, if that book, if I had that book, I would just X out that S. Um, oh, a book I, title. Yeah, like it's a little. Oh, it work made book. it through publishing and everything. Sure did. I mean, and I have seen this Jamie on, like, an Oreo cookie display. Like, I, I've literally. I mean, it is prevalent in our society. And then the other one that drives me absolutely crazy. See, I'm really passionate about this. Is when people use over instead of more than for numbers. Okay, so give me another it, example. So like if it said on a book, over 1 million copies sold. That is actually not correct. 
you can't go over a number. It's more than. Numbers should always be more than. So it should be more than a million copies sold. Typically, they're using it either because they don't know or because of space limitations, I okay, feel like. Uh -huh. um, but it always should be more than for a number. Okay. So that drives me crazy. And then passive voice drives me crazy in writing. So lots of there is, there are, there were, you know, not making the sentence active. That also, I'm like, how would I rewrite this? Oh so, my gosh. I need people like you in my life because none of these things bother me. Not one. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm crazy. There's also that. <laughs> I just typed in towards in dictionary.com and it, it comes up as toward. Yes. Right. You're totally right. I did not that I was doubting you. I was just looking. I, uh, you made me nervous. I was like, oh, can I have been added in in like the urban slang dictionary? Um, but no, there is no S on toward. Okay. I love hearing people's pet peeves. It's <laughs> just the best because I wouldn't know that about you now, but are you going to think less of me when you hear me, when you see me write towards? No, I am absolutely Except not. you're going to, you're going to text me and be like, I told you this. Why are you still doing this? <laughs> I mean, there are far, you know, worse things to worry about in the world. But when I think about a pet peeve, that's something that that, that really hilarious. just kind of bugs me. Does your husband know about this? Um, he's probably the same way. I mean, he's really good when it comes to writing and grammar. But I don't know that we've actually had a discussion about it. I think it's hilarious. I think it's the best. <laughs> pet peeves, are they make me giggle because – People have the most outlandish pet peeves, and it's just the funniest thing ever because it's just what gets to them, and that's why it's a pet peeve. I love it. It's exactly. my favorite question to ask. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, Jessica, thanks so much for coming on the Happy Half Hour with me. It was a joy. Thank you so much for having me. And, Jamie, I just want to tell you, you're doing such great work. Oh, you're so Your sweet. Your podcast is my favorite podcast to listen to. I think I've listened to almost every single episode. And you really are the girlfriend that we all want. And so thank you for doing this and for investing your time and your resources and your energy and time away from your family because – it is really making a difference and inspiring and encouraging and uplifting a lot of women. So oh, That's what I want it to be. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, in case this is your first time to listen, go back and check out the show we just had this past Wednesday. It was with my friend Amy from the Bobby Bones Show. And next weekend, I have Elise Fitzpatrick, who I just love and adore. Um, guys, thanks for listening to the happy hour, and I will see you next Wednesday. Bye.